thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, pleasure to speak in such a nice auditorium. <clears throat> and I hope you'll ring the bell at the end of my talk as well as the beginning. Otherwise I might go on too long. Uh, so this was joint work with my PhD student, Katie Steckles, uh, who finished about three years ago. Uh, this was actually, we, we did most of this after she finished. But she's not doing uh, mathematics research anymore. She's not working in public engagement of science, which is very honorable, very difficult. So uh, choreographies, these are special solutions of the n-body problem. The n-body problem is n particles attracting under gravity and how they move. Of course, the two-body problem was solved in some sense by Kepler and then properly solved by Newton. And uh, the three-body problem is impossible to solve. It's chaotic. Uh, even Poincaré realized it was too hard to really solve it. So people look for spe special solutions. Uh, most of the solutions that are sort of obvious ones were maybe you put four particles equidistant on a circle and make them rotate if they're identical. So that's the easy solutions. There, there are lots of those. There are uh, some not so easy, but they're found by uh, they called central configurations in the plane, and then you can set them rotating or collapsing. Um, but people have been looking for solutions, particularly for the three-body problem since Poincaré analyzed it and realized how difficult it was, but before then too. And so it was very remarkable in 2000 when a new solution was found, which I'm sure many of you have seen before, which is called the figure eight, for obvious reasons. So it's important here that the three particles are identical. So everything I say will just be for identical particles, because part of the method for finding this is to use the permutation symmetry that physicists like so much, where you, so you need to be able to swap the particles so they have to be identical. Uh, so the, the basic, the definition of a choreography is that you have some curve and you have n particles, in general three here, that follow each other around the curve. Um, so this was discovered, well it was discovered numerically but nobody really noticed by uh, a guy called Chris Moore states. And he was looking at how, how you might use braids, braid groups to understand dynamics. So you can see the three particles moving around and if you see that as a, you can see that as a braid. Well, in fact, I'll come on to talk about braids at the end. Uh, but this was, uh, <coughs> so that, that was found numerically. And then independently, a few years later, Alain Chancinet at Paris and Richard Montgomery from California provided a proof that this actually exists as a solution. And it's a, a very delicate variational argument, so I'm not going to go into that. It's quite a bit of analysis and estimates and things like that, which is not my expertise at all. So there are three aspects to, to this. There's the analysis, which is a bit that I, I leave to others. There's geometry and algebra. So I do the geometry and algebra. So, um, so that one was the first one, and they proved that it exists. And then the next one, so it's called the figure eight. And then there's this one, which was called the super eight, uh, which was discovered by a guy, Joe Gerber, in, in the state, but numerically. So he said, oh, well, there were these, there's this three one. Maybe there's something similar for four bodies. And he found this one, as I said, numerically. Since then, it's been proved to, you know, analytically, proves something like this exists. Of course, you can't prove that it's actually that curve, but you can prove that there is a minimum of some uh, action function along some infinite dimensional loop space that has certain properties, and the properties in particular are, one, no collisions, and that's the technical difficulty with this program, uh, and two, it has this symmetry. Um, so let me just compare the symmetry. This is a, a theme that will recur a few times. So this one has an obvious symmetry. The curve, you can reflect it. It has the symmetry of the rectangle. Two reflections, and obviously the product is the rotation by pi. Some of those reflections reverse the orientation of motion. Uh, so up-down reflecting. 
reverses the, the, motion, the direction of motion, but left to right preserves the direction, because on both sides they, they're going down. So if you do the reflection, so it's sort of surprising. One would think immediately, oh, reflection, it's going to reverse the orientation. But no, it doesn't necessarily. And the sort of argument they used there was some, see if I can stop it at the right moment. They stopped it one instant earlier. The three would have been in a straight line with equal spacing. And so they took variations of paths starting from this and going to well, the isosceles triangle. So the symmetries of this one, this isosceles, and the uh, first point, at those instants there would be symmetries. And uh, so that was part of the ingredients of the proof was using these symmetries. Um, but at most times, there's no symmetry to the configuration of particles. No, no, the green and purple are closer together than the orange, and there's no, no transformation of the plane which preserves those. Uh, but on the other hand, for the super eight, at any instant, Well, that's a special. But at any instant, I rotate by pi, and it permutes the particles. So rotate by pi. So there's a difference between the type of symmetry of the two cases. Um, this part of the symmetry is being called the core of the of the uh, symmetry of the choreography. So let me show you a, a few more. So those two are classical, and. Uh, Carles Simon from Barcelona had spent the summer uh, on sabbatical visiting Charles Chenet in Paris, and he produced thousands of these choreographies, numerically, using very, uh, very uh, good numerics. He's a real expert in numerical methods for dynamical systems. Uh, and uh, so there are thousands. Not, you, so what he realized was that if you take any curve, parameterized curve. And so this is parameterized. And you put 50 particles on it. And then you, you can measure the action. So as I said, it's a variational problem. So the action is this thing. I won't write full name because I'm not going to use it. It's just a function that depends on the curve. And these these choreographies are minimum, minima of the action, or critical points more generally. Minima is what, what uh, Simon was doing. So if you try doing in the space of you're taking a finite Fourier series, maybe a thousand terms or something, this is in fact a uh, numerical uh, of computing harmony, uh, 10,000 terms, and try and minimize it by using a gradient or something minimizing algorithm, it will relax down to a, a choreography. Something that will look something similar. I mean, maybe this will be here, it will be over there. But uh, there will be some similarity. So once, once uh, the idea had arisen, it was clear that there were lots of them. Some of them have symmetry. Some of them have no symmetry. So here's one that has uh, no symmetry. The curve has no symmetry. But the problem has a symmetry because the, the permutation of the particles happens. It's a cyclic permutation. So the light blue follows the pink, which follows the orange. Which, so, so there's a cyclic permutation, which happens here. There are six particles. So after one sixth of a period, of a period the particles commute. So that's, well, as, as we'll see, that's a symmetry or can be expressed as a symmetry of the problem. Uh, yeah, so that'll do for the, for the moment. So the setup is like this. So n identical particles, we can fix um, the center of mass at the origin. 
So they have coordinates. I'm identifying R2 playing with complex numbers, so Z1, Z2, up to Zn n particles. And we assume it's periodic, let's say period 1, just for the sake of argument. Um, so the time takes place in a, in a circle, R mod Z, and uh, for each T, Zj is, is the point in the complex plane. Uh, and we're going to assume the center of mass at zero, and importantly, we assume there are no collisions because we're looking for uh, no, non-collision solutions. Although there are interesting things to say in the case of collisions, but these symmetry groups that I'm going to talk about assume no collisions at all. That's the basis of the, of the classification. So here's the condition of being the choreography. So we have a curve Z0 of T, and each of these follow around the same curve with a delay of the n particles, the zeroth particle, ah, but different number, it well, doesn't matter. The first particle is at t plus 1 over n, the second at t plus 2 over n, and so on. So they follow each other uniformly in the parameterization, uniformly around the curve. So the symmetry of this system is, uh, so let, let me just go back. Uh, Makes more sense to say it now. So, <clears throat> the, the first problem that we addressed was <coughs> what are all the possible symmetries of these for, for a choreography? Uh, we've seen two cases the figure 8, which has some symmetry, and the super 8 with four particles, which has a different symmetry. And then I'll show you many more. Um, so, that's the first one. And then the second part of the talk will be okay, so if we fix a symmetry group, there are going to be lots of curves with that symmetry. Some of them are homotopic in the space of where there are no collisions. You can homotop from one curve to another, but many times there are some which just look very different. They have the same symmetry, but they look very different, as we'll see. And they're in different connected components of the loops with that given symmetry. So possible motions. I'm not, I'm not saying during the talk, I'm not saying that these are uh, actual solutions of the n-body problem. They're just candidate curves. And then one can apply sort of Seymour's method to minimize the action and to try and find a, a numerical solution, which is what I've done. I've got lots of pictures I'll show you of different uh, curves, different choreographies with different symmetries. So there are two problems I want to try and address. Uh, so, oops. so there are three types of symmetry here. There's the rotations and reflections in the plane, fixing the, the origin because that's the center of mass, so we don't move that, so it's just O2. Uh, permutations of the particles, because they're all identical. And then we're allowed time translations. That's important. Uh, and we're also going to, so because some of these reflections reverse the time, we want to introduce uh, uh, time reflections, orientation reversing. So this is actually the group O2, but not to confuse with this O2, I call it S1 hat. So uh, the space group, which is O2, and the permutations acts as you'd imagine. It just moves all of the particles the same way, or it permutes the indices. And tau acts in this way. So it's just, uh, it might be T2, if tau is rotation by theta, then this would be t plus theta. And if it's uh, a reflection, then it would be minus t goes in. Uh, gamma of t changes to gamma of minus t. Obvious attractions. So we say a loop has symmetry sigma, the usual language of symmetry. So we take a subgroup of this. So the loop is, if it's fixed by sigma, so that means we take this triple element O2, the permutation, and the time uh, translation or reflection on the loop gives us the same loop back again. So, in particular, the cartography condition can be written as a symmetry like this. So, sigma 1 is the notation I use for the cycle 1 to 2 to 3 to up to n. So, it's fixed by this element. So, sigma 1 
and minus 1 over n, which is the translation in time. So that means that, well, it's exactly it means this condition. So Z1 of t would be Z0 of t minus 1 over n, minus one, uh, plus 1 over n. It acts by the inverse. So, and so sigma 1, as I said, is this permutation. So that, that group of symmetries is, is given because that's the definition of the choreography. And now I want to know what other symmetries it can have. So some bigger group. So this is the classification. The problem is now finding all symmetry groups that contain this cyclic choreography group, Cn, and assuming no collisions. So sigma is some group, and I'm going to assume it's finite. We could also have an infinite group, which would be the full circle group, and then that's just n particles equally spaced around a circle rotated. So I consider that that case is understood, finished, dealt with. So sigma is now finite. And uh, it's a subgroup of a big group that's acting. So what curves can have this symmetry sigma? Um, given that there are no collisions. Um, so the analysis is based on this projection. So we take this group sigma and we project out <coughs> the time component. So there are two cases to consider. First, this map is, this projection is injective. Uh, and that tells us uh, that sigma is isomorphic to a finite subgroup of Two, so it's either cyclic or dihedral. That's all. Um, and then the other case is that it's not injective, and I'll come to that in a minute uh, and explain what it means. So, well, I want, I, I've written more details than I intend to say. But if it's cyclic, if it was cyclic, then it's generated by some element. So, according to what the element might be, you get different symmetry groups. So. Uh, the time component, it contains this projection, the image contains the time component for the choreography, which is 1 over n. So it must be, that's some subgroup, so the whole the image must be 1 over kn for some, for some k, so in the generator. So that's that. Sigma is just some permutation, and a is a reflection or a rotation. And then you go through by analyzing what, what A could be in sigma in order to get a cyclic group and no collisions. Uh, so the kth power of this, g to the power k, is minus 1 over n here. It's just multiplication by k. So that means that the kth power of sigma must be the one that was in the choreography. Sigma 1, the 1, 2, 3, 4. So we have to find out what permutations have kth power equal to that cycle, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And uh, so this in particular implies that k and n must be co-prime. And then we look at possible a's such that a to the k equals 1. a to the power k is the identity. So this leads to two types of symmetry with cyclic image. So. Uh, This is just a notation. So, but in particular, the K over L is maybe familiar. It's the Schleffli symbol of a, of a polygon. So, let me try and draw a pentagon. So, Schleffli is German, and he classified mostly 3D polytopes of things. He was interested in. But he had a notation for those and for, for, for polygons. So this is called just 5 or 5, 1. A pentagram has the same symmetry, it has five-fold dihedral symmetry. This is called 5, 2. And the difference between the 1 and the 2 is if we start here, when you move along the, the, the curve, you go, this is n, this is n plus 1. 
here we go from n to n plus 2. So five-fold symmetry, and you go from each vertex to two for so that's the notation of KL here. So this means, this notation just means that there are n particles and that the curve has this sort of symmetry. So you might have seven particles with five stroke two. So you can have seven going around something that will be a curved version of this what actually from the pentagram, which is on a curved. Um, and then so this, this could just be cyclic, so of course this, these curves have uh, reflect, these polygons have reflection symmetry, but you could imagine a, a version of them that's not quite so, uh, doesn't have the reflection symmetry. Um, and then there's a dihedral one which is similar classification, but with an extra reflection. So let me show some of these. So this was the one that I was originally most pleased of. It took a lot of work to find it. Uh, because previous to this, this classification, which suggested to me what to look for, um, all the uh, solutions with three bodies had the same sort of symmetry as the figure eight, or maybe less. Um, but it only had some order two reflection rotation, whereas this has an order four rotation for three particles, so that was surprising. I tried quite hard to find one with order five in the classification uh, they must exist, but every uh, time I looked for it, well, I couldn't find one. Uh, but somebody else has found one, so, so that's nice. Uh, I'll show you a very nice website at the end. <laughs> so that's so this, this, in the notation, it has a reflection symmetry, so it's a D, three particles, four, or four slash one. So that's both D, three, four, that's the, root, the symmetry of the square, and uh, three particles. Here's four particles. We saw one with four on the super eight. Here's four, and it has six-fold symmetry, D4, six. And if you watch it, for example, one of the, the coloring is just, the person who wrote the program put the colors in. So, but they're nice colors. It's nice to see how the opposite ones. If you go around the curve, it goes green, orange, green, orange. Does it imply? No. 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 Because the analysis is missing. Um, so I'll say something about that later. Uh, so what I've done is, like what Simo did, but not with such sophisticated numerics, I did it very simply. I took maybe 20 terms in the Fourier series, not to 10,000, and tried to minimize the action. I just used made for very naive prep me. Uh, so, there's a chance they exist, but I don't have uh, any sort of proof. Um, so that's, uh, and if you watch, for example, the or orange one, you see that it, it goes around this loop, and then it goes around the next loop, and then the next one. So it's D6, D4 particles, 6, 1. I usually suppress the one. This is five, and it has eight-fold symmetry. So here, an interesting sequence of four, I think. So this is six particles, and it has, obviously, the symmetry of the square, four-fold symmetry. This also looks very different six particles with full fold symmetry. So this is all D6, four. There's another one with six particles with full fold symmetry. And a 
So these are all, they look quite different. And in fact, you can't take a continuous path from one to the other without going through a, a moment where there's a collision. So in the space of loops with this given symmetry, they're in different connected components, excluding the collision. So I'll come to that. Yes. We'll talk about later. Um, so you notice this is D. This is too small. Can you see that? D64. I said earlier that N and K had to be co-prime. That was for this map tau, this projection onto the time component, to be injected. <coughs> so in this case, for example, it's not injected, and you can see that because, it's like I said earlier, if I stop at any instant, any instant there's a symmetry. So when that tau was injected, meant that there was um, uh, usually no symmetries for most values of t. Whereas if it's not injective, then the kernel is precisely this, because it happens for all time. It's a symmetry uh, which doesn't map onto a particular time value. So these have a core. It's six and four are co-prime. Uh, the highest common factor is two, and it has a two-fold symmetry. We have d6, uh, 12 or something, and the highest common factor. Six. They don't exist, but uh, you can't have n divided k. But uh, if it did, then it'd be a six fold metric every instant. So here's one where they co prime again. So this produced these was weeks. I would set the computer going at night, and I'd go to bed and wake up in the morning and hope it converged, and sometimes it converged to going around a circle. Uh, Anyway, that was fun. So, uh, <coughs> so the second case, as I said, was tau. This projection is not injective. And then we have a core, and that core was what I just described in the picture. So I won't go through it. One, the, 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 the important observation is just that if you have a core, then of degree of order C, then for C particles that are doing exactly the same thing. So you can actually factor out that, and you get a slightly different analytic problem. Uh, but topologically or algebraically, it's the same as having uh, N over C particles and K over C symmetry. So you can analyze it like that. So the, the classification theorem is these ones, which was ones where they're going around curves like I showed you just now, and then there's some, if n is odd, there were some exceptional ones like the figure 8. So in these ones, any reflection, like imagine particles going around this curve, if I do any reflection, it'll reverse the orientation of the motion. Whereas with these three, uh, there are reflections, like the figure 8, reflections which don't reverse our the orientation. So there are just a few of those. For each odd number of particles, there are three types. So here's one. This, this is proved to exist. So there are seven particles going around the figure eight, but this, is more, this one's more interesting. Uh, there are seven particles. And there's only one reflection. No, no, sorry. There are two reflections. One of them, like the figure eight, one of them reverses the uh, orientation. Uh, the vertical, the reflection in the horizontal reverses the orientation, but the reflection in the vertical. Is, so it's like the figure eight. Here's one with just one reflection. And it, this reflection does not reverse the orientation of motion. And the student decided that looked like a piece of ginger. So this is nine, nine particles on a piece of ginger. Uh, and, uh, 
this also has, this just has a rotational symmetry, and the rotation does reverse the orientation of the curve. And then a couple more just to show you. Oh, this one. I like this one. If I leave them going, then you won't listen to the rest of the talk. I think they're very mesmerizing. <coughs> so, so the second part, as I said, was to know if I fix the symmetry group, what's the topology of the set of loops with that symmetry? Uh, or at least, if not the topology, then at least how many, not how many connect, connected components, because at least in this problem it's always infinite. But in some sense we want to be able to label the connected components. So the general setting is, is that we have a group, G, which was before O2 cross the permutations, acting on a manifold. The manifold there was N, uh, R to uh, C complex numbers to uh, to the N, O oh, minus 1 if we fix the different mass. So it was C, N minus 1. So that's telling you where the N particles are in the plane. So that's the manifold N. And lambda M is the sort of loops, standard notation, which is just continuous maps from S1 to the manifold. And so if we take a subgroup sigma like before in the product of G plus S1, so I'm not including time reversing in that part at all. This is just uh, S1, just orientation preserving uh, changes on the, on the circle, it's the time circle. So then the lambda M upper sigma means the loops on M with this symmetry. Symmetry defined like we did before. So there's a classical theorem in topology, and I've asked several topologists, whose theorem is it? Because I keep quoting it, and they say, oh, it's classical. Oh, it's classical. Everybody knows it. I know everybody knows it, but where did it come from? I don't know. So if anybody knows who proved this first, it's in Klingenberg's book on closed geodesics on manifolds, but maybe it was known before. Anyway, so if we forget the symmetry, connected components of the loop space are classified by conjugacy classes in the fundamental group, one-to-one -one correspondence. So with sigma, how does this, how does this change? So there's a, a group that's been defined in the 1960s by Frank Rhodes. He wasn't thinking about this problem at all. He was doing something else. Um, so I called it G. Uh, sometimes called the equivariant fundamental group, at least if G is finite. Uh, pi 1 G of M base to X, so it's very similar to the gamma of curves, uh, but, and G is in the group. So if G is the identity, this will just be the ordinary fundamental group. So what we say is we have uh, so here's the manifold, Here's the point x, and it's independent of x, like homotopy. M, we'll assume m is connected, so here's gx. And instead of taking loops like a fundamental group, we take paths up to homotopy, paths that go from x to gx. So that's one element up to homotopy, and there's another element. Imagine it's very similar to the fundamental group, but, but you're not going from x to x, you're going from x to gx. So, as I said, this is a group. And I haven't told you how to multiply elements. So, so if we take two elements of this group, here's, let's say, hx. So in, fundamental, in the fundamental group, of course, it's easy to compose groups because uh, loops because they go back to the same place. So you just go around one, and then you go around the other one. So here, of course, if you go along gamma, you can't do delta then. So you can't naively uh, compose them. But what you can do, so this is this one is represented by gamma g. 
and this one by delta H. So it's important, the group element, even if, the, if, even if X is fixed, it's important in this definition that the G is, the, the G information is there. So even if GX is X, so it would come back, gamma G is not the same as gamma of the identity of the group element is important. So how do we compose, uh, like in homotopy, well, we first do gamma, and then we do G of delta. So that goes from GX to GHX, right? So that's and you can prove all the lemmas about respecting homotopy classes and so on. <coughs> so, um, I think of this projection from this group to G, which means I take uh, gamma G, I just take the G component. Then the kernel is the, the the, the loops where the group element is the identity, so they're going from x back to x, so it's the fundamental group. So, so the fundamental group is normal subgroup by one g, because it's the kernel of theta. And so my m is suddenly become x. x is m. So the, the theorem is, so this is the basic property of groups, which I'm sure you saw in early group theory course. Uh, what allows you to define quotient groups. So if, if n is normal in G, then um, uh, conjugation by n preserves each closer uh, n. Uh, Gn. These are the left or right, it doesn't matter because they're it's a normal circle, left cosets. So if I conjugate by an element of n, it stays in the same, uh, same coset. So the usual picture for the branches to n. This is g of n, n, gn, so on. So uh, conjugation by n acts as a permutation on each. Uh, Block. So the the theorem that corresponds to the theorem on the connected components of lambda m conjugacy classes of pi one become connected uh, components of loops with given sigma is pi one is a normal subgroup. This g was pi one g. So we say uh, pi 1 acts by conjugacy on each block. So how many conjugacy classes are there? So each, each element of this corresponds to a conjugacy class in, in this. Some people call these twisted conjug conjugacy classes in the group, but they're conjugacy classes in the coset. So that's the... Uh, the, the results. So what what happens for choreographies? I won't go into details. So pi one of these n particles moving in the plane is well known. It's the pure braid group. So the, the braid group maybe I should remind some people. What the braid group looks like. So you take. Uh, M strings, and you wrap them around each other. Well, that's a, that's a fairly simple braid, and it, they form a group because by composition you just draw one under the other and you compose them like that. Um, and you can, you, it's 
fairly uh, clear that this pi 1 of this motion of n particles or positions of n particles with no collision on the plane because as they move around each other it's just like there's one particle, here's one particle and they've just moved around each other. So you have to prove it, but anyway, it's a classical theorem from I can't remember the 40s or something, 1940s. And it's a pure braid uh, if every Every one, every particle comes back to, or every string comes back to the same position. It's a pure break. That means the particles have gone around and come back to the same place. Uh, so it's, a, it's an element of the fundamental group. So it's a pure break. And this equivariant group is essentially the break group. So I've only done it for the permutation. There's also the rotations in the plane. Um, so, uh, that adds something that uh, it just makes it a bit more complicated. It's a, a semi-direct product with the break. I'll leave it like that. So um, the result of that theorem is that the connected components of loops with this symmetry type are uh, conjugacy classes of conjugacy by the pure break group in a particular coset in the full break group. And which coset is it? It's that B is something with whose uh, projection well, in this case we take it eight and one goes to three, three goes to two, two goes to one. So we have the one goes to three goes to two, four goes to five. So there's a map from the homomorphism from the break group to the permutation group. Uh, and that's G here is, would be whatever generator your symmetry group has. So you take any braid with that particular permutation, uh, and then that coset would be the, you have to look for the uh, conjugacy classes in this coset. So to fully answer the question, you need to know more than I do about uh, the break group, the structure of the break group. So one can say a little bit more. If M is aspherical, so M was the manifold of X, uh, is aspherical, which means that its universal cover is simply connected, um, then the components of this loop space are also aspherical, and so you can say uh, you can say something about what the fundamental group of each of the components is. So the component comp containing gamma, by one of that is the set of isomorphic to the set of pure braids which commute with a given with a given braid, the, the one that represents your loop gamma. Um, so there's a nice algebraic uh, characterization, not just the connected components, but in this case, which is the case in the choreographies. Um, so come back to the question of whether these exist or not, the difficulty is that when you apply the variational problem, so this is a classification of connected components and loop space. So you take each loop, each connected component, and in the variational problem, you want to minimize this function of dimensional things. So you hope that the minimum is of the interior of this component, connected component, which is ultimate, of course. But it could happen that actually that's not true because collisions could have a finite action. So it might be for some connected components that the minimum actually happens on the boundary. So this, this approach doesn't really help in those cases. It's generally thought that it doesn't happen very often, whatever that means. Um, although Simon numerically had some suggestions that there were components with no, with no minimum in them. But uh, that's only numerical evidence. It's not really clear. But there is a, there's a, a cheat that Poincaré was the first to notice, that if you replaced uh, 
the, the usual gravitational force is 1 over r squared. And if you replace it with what he called the strong force, 1 over r cubed, then whenever there's a collision, the action is infinite. So that means that in each component, there must be a minimum. There's a bit of analysis to prove for acidity, uh, the action function. Um, so then, if we allow this other force, the one of the R cubed force, then that, uh, there's, there's definitely, for every uh, connected component, for each of these symmetry groups, there's definitely a solution. And moreover, you can use some Morse theory to say how many critical points there are in each component because you can estimate the topology of the component. Um, so also, although I haven't followed this through, um, one of my motivations was to think about what you could say using this approach to, like the closed geodesic problem, there's uh, lots of famous papers. First, the book by... Uh, what his name, I said it earlier, Klingenberg, thank you, um, about closed existence of closed geodesics on manifolds, and then uh, Schnurlman and Wüstenich uh, and Fett also proved theorems about estimating using the topology, so, uh, so there should be some results that are fairly easy to obtain, and I haven't, haven't done so. So I'd like to just finish by Pointing out, I don't want to click it. There's a fantastic website. Yeah. So, there's a. Do any of these other ones? So, I, this general theorem if we replace 1 over r squared for the force, we have 1 over r cubed, then these all exist. But what about the real 1 over r squared problem? So, there are these difficult analysis estimates, and there are several that have been proved to exist. The ten or something, starting with the figure eight and then the super eight, and there are some other ones that have actually been proved to exist. Um, so, but there's a, a young guy called Gregory Minton, who was a PhD student at uh, MIT. He finished maybe two years ago. He has this fantastic website. So he was a computer science student. So he can really, he knows about programming. So you have a suggestion for, <coughs> so he used the R notation for the symmetry group. So let's say nine particles and uh, rotate by Five-fold rotation to each time. So let's try drawing one. This is a uh, five, so it might not work, but uh, what does it look like? Pentagon. Uh, pentagram. Okay, not very good. He knows I'm not very good at drawing. So there, he's produced one that has the symmetry I put in. And now I go, and it converges. It uses a Newton, Newton's method to, to, to try and find the minimum. Or actually, not just the minimum, but any stationary point of action. It's fantastic. So under here, you can see all sorts of examples that he and other people have found. If I click on any of these, there's one that I showed you earlier. So crowdsourced one, so this is people who have played with this. Uh, so here's this amazing one. Four particles, and it really looks like a pentagon. Mm -hmm. So then there's the question, do these actually exist? So he's written, one of his interests as a PhD student was automatic theorem proving. So he wants to do us all out of a job. Uh, but he, um, so how do you do automatic theorem proving? Well, you need... You've, you've, you find your candidate solution with 10,000 coefficients in your Fourier series, and then you do some, uh, you, you, and the computer to do some analysis to estimate 
in, in the flow, uh, when you come back, there really is a fixed point. So the Newton's method converges, and he can prove it using sort of interval arithmetic in, in the infinite dimensional loop space. I think it sounds like a very clever bit of programming and uh, clever ideas. I haven't done it. He hasn't written it up yet because he's been doing other things. So you know, I've tried to convince him to write it, write it up. But anyway, so I believe all of the ones he's got here, he's proved they exist using his theorem-proving algorithm. Uh, so you can play with this. Uh, you can, um, if you find one that's not, you can email it to him and he'll, uh, he'll uh, put it through his automatic <coughs> theorem prover and see if it really exists or if it's just an accident of some numerics of many terms in the Fourier series. But these ones, because I believe he's, he's proved they all exist. So including the one that, uh, that I found at the beginning. So there's three on the fourfold symmetry. Some people didn't believe that that would exist, but he proved. He said it was very delicate. He had to go to something like 30,000 or 50,000 Fourier coefficients. Actually proved that it exists. All that stuff. Okay. So some advertisement at the end for somebody else's work. Okay. Thanks very much. <coughs> Thank you.